Okay, very good morning. Hope everyone is well. It is Tuesday the 15th of October. Uh, going to run you through the morning's headlines from an update on the trade war, Brexit, going to look at oil and we're going to look at earnings from my perspective. Also going to look at Chinese inflation data overnight. Uh, but to kick things off, quick overview of just general market sentiment at the open this morning. Uh, stock futures are trading on the front foot this morning, we are already testing the R1 in regards to the US indices in both the S&P and NASDAQ. Uh, the, the DAX, though, outperforming the touch, already had a, a run-up to its R2 this morning. So after what was a fairly uh, kind of benign finish on Wall Street, I mean, it was actually I mean, the S&P only down marginally. Um, Asian stocks not really giving away too much. If anything, a little bit of... Uh, I guess positivity just fading uh, late into the session yesterday about the the kind of how long lasting or in fact um, how this Chinese deal will play out in the long run that they brokered in that partial deal at the weekend. Um, but this morning things a little bit more positive again. There is a bit of an update on Brexit which has meant that in that top chart the pound is outperforming a little bit. I'll get into those uh, headlines in a moment. Uh, so gold down uh, only slightly, about $2, just sub its pivot at the moment, having broke below that point in the futures earlier uh, in the session. And the US 10-year, slight positive on the, the session, but only a touch, about three ticks at the moment. And then WCI crude is still trading lower by about 40 cents this morning. So the cross-asset class, um, cross class is a little bit mixed at the moment. Um, oil and gold down. I mean, the dollar is recovering a little bit at the moment. It's basically reversed its losses to flatten the Dixie, given some of the upward movements seen, particularly in cable this morning. Uh, Euro dollar, though, uh, and cable seeing a little bit of a divergence there, and definitely because sterling currency is underpinned by some fundamental developments on Brexit, which we'll discuss. Uh, but going straight into the headlines, um, this is quite an interesting chart I saw this morning. This is looking at the MSCI Asia-Pacific index daily move and so just looking at the broader Asia pack region and looking at the percentage changes that generally we've been seeing in this index and the point being is that the latest partial trade um, deal between the US and China in the last couple of days is being met with smaller or more shallow kind of reactions in the market and I think it's almost like the feels like we're in that boy that cried wolf kind of mentality where it's kind of like okay yeah we have this short term reprieve or relief in the markets they kind of lift but then it's like well okay so they've committed to do what they've already been doing which is purchase larger amounts of agricultural goods and then in kind the US delays tariffs that were going to be implemented today but the December ones are still there as a looming threat so all in all is this really a partial deal of the is this more just a kicking in a can down the road exercise and it almost feels like we're back in that that kind of continuous loop again and I think that's largely reflected by the way that the uh, market participants now are reacting this, to this type of information. It's c kind of having lesser bang for its buck in that respect. And it's kind of what I was trying to suggest yesterday that I don't really see much more in it in terms of response, given the fact that ultimately there's still much to do on things like intellectual property theft and, uh, and those looming tariffs in December. So... Um, with that being said, although Trump has been talking this up because obviously it, it looks good for him, it's almost as if then part of the back door discussions have been, well, Stephen, as in the US Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, you go out there and start just firing a couple shots uh, over the barrel saying that you know there's a new round of tariffs set for December 15th for $156 billion of Chinese goods that will be triggered if Beijing failed to seal the limited deal tentatively struck by Trump last week. So it's kind of a bit of a warning sign there from the US to say to China, because we've been here, of course, many times before. They kind of have a deal in principle, but then it never really gets ratified. And so the US just kind of stamping down their foot to make sure that that does, in fact, happen at this point. So still much to play for, I think, with this trade situation. Uh, but you know, as per that previous graph, I think any response in markets is becoming increasingly short-lived and I do think that is a consideration if you're holding uh, more kind of medium-term positions in the market. Moving over to Brexit, what is the situation at the moment? 
uh, well, Boris Johnson's Brexit deal on a knife edge. Talks may continue after the Brussels summit, according to the EU president. Now, what we've got here as a timeline, of course, was that a deal was supposed to have been brokered around now so that then it can kind of be uh, discussed and finalised in the EU summit happening on Thursday and Friday. This all then coming before that legislation that passed in the UK a couple of weeks ago that Boris must then write a letter to Brussels asking or requesting at least for a delay. Now, what's being suggested both yesterday and by the presidency of the EU uh, this morning is talking about, well, perhaps then we could have more discussions ongoing on the sidelines of this summit. And as we heard yesterday, could there be another EU summit on the 29th and 30th of October, giving just one or two days left then to broker this potential deal? So that's kind of becoming more and more potential uh, for a renewed kind of timeline in that respect. But the reason why the pound has kind of responded quite positively, albeit originally this morning, it's already come back a touch at the moment. Uh, but this was from Tony Connolly. Uh, if you don't follow Tony Connolly on Twitter and you are um, involved in any Brexit or UK related trades, particularly uh, related to, to Brexit developments, then you need to follow this guy. He is basically the RTE Europe editor and so very much informed with the negotiations that are going on and he tweeted this morning that the UK will table fresh proposals to break the Brexit deadlock this morning according to his sources. He said two well-placed sources have confirmed that UK negotiators will bring forward a new text when they meet European Commission negotiators in Brussels this morning. It follows a 90-minute meeting between Boris Johnson and DUP leader Arlene Foster and Deputy Leader Nigel Dodds in Downing Street last night. It's not clear yet if the proposals are a revised version of the dual customs scheme which the UK proposed following the breakthrough meeting between Leo Varadkar and Boris Johnson last week or whether there's something much different. The development follows a downbeat assessment by the EU Chiefs negotiators on Sunday over the dual customs idea. Uh, it goes on, um, but some of that positivity this morning just coming on the back of that however the pound is already pulling back a little bit and as I can see the dollar is really you know strengthening here at the moment and partly that's probably due to euro dollar just coming under some pressure breaking the overnight Asia Pacific low pushing down to its S1 at the moment um, but one of the things here that I would say and I know Sam is uh, is often saying this to you guys is that how often have we been here before where there's a rumor that comes out about a potential deal only to be refuted uh, a few moments later and then we get a reversal of the entire move. So again, when you get these source comments, the way I'd say to suggest this if you're trading off news headlines intraday is that if it's a source comment, I would say uh, history has shown me that you should be a little bit more proactive, a bit more prudent in terms of the, the time that you hold on to those trades, i.e. the timeline should be shorter if it is someone more official, like the EU president, the EU commission, uh, the prime minister spokeswoman, something like that, then obviously that gives you a little bit more concrete evidence that this is someone official saying something, so the move could be a little bit longer lasting. The source comments though, if you think about the way that accredited news agencies work, the fact that RT have broke this, Bloomberg or Reuters will be wanting to put out their kind of latest piece as well. And so it's not unsurprising to see conflicting headlines come out as newspapers are kind of jostling for position to maintain uh, their relevance in a sense, you know, in terms of breaking news. So yeah, timelines, I think with, with any Brexit source comments, going to get a little bit more volatile over the coming days as we go into that summit. I think just, just act um, a little bit cautiously in the execution side of things and risk managing uh, in that regard. Okay, moving on off Brexit and off China, uh, US earnings, there's, there's a few coming out today and this is really, as I said, uh, in the preview for the week on Monday, uh, we kind of pick up pace now and it's the big banks that are going to be coming out today. So a couple of things to point out here before we look at all the other companies coming out. And there's five things to watch as big banks kick off earnings season. So I'm going to run through those now and, uh, and things that might make a bit more sense when you're picking through the numbers later on this morning. And one is cost cutting. 
Now, we've seen this from a number of obviously large European banking institutions like Commerce, Deutsche, Credit Suisse, UBS, all these types of firms cutting back on their staff. Uh, one of the things then to look out for uh, in that regard is so-called efficiency ratios. Um, trading is another area of which gets closely followed and some people suggesting that increased volatility uh, during the month of August in the summer, obviously as we're getting a lot of these breaking comments to do with trade wars and the topsy-turvy market moves that we were seeing, means that there's generally more uh, action for the banks to facilitate trades uh, and therefore making more profit on execution. Uh, however, on the downside in the rates environment, uh, JP Morgan City and Wells Fargo have already been warning investors that their net interest income so that's money banks make from customers' loan payments minus what they pay depositors would fall in the third quarter because interest rates have been declining. Uh, and again, this kind of uh, margin squeeze, if you like, continues to be that case because, of course, we're expecting another rate cut, potentially two, by the end of the year, which is going to put more pressure on that particular area of the banks in the lending environment. The one thing, though, that lower rates does mean for banks is obviously mortgages. Uh, and one area that low interest rates can help is the housing market. The Mortgage Bankers Association, the MBA, that, that's the body that releases those weekly mortgage application figures. They estimated that 21% increase in originations in Q3 and a 58% jump in refinancing. So obviously, given this renewed now, we're on that interest rate hike trajectory, but we're now having to what is most likely to be a third interest rate cut. It's not a bad time to refinance in that, that respect. Another area, the final two, is one is consumers. Uh, and US consumers can still be counted to help, if anything, some of the underlying numbers at the banks because spending is holding up amid a relatively healthy job market situation for the moment. And credit quality, according to the metrics we've been seeing through economic data, has remained relatively robust. Um, so the consumer side is fine. However, looking at the investment banking division, that's a completely different ballgame. Um, it's been the worst quarter in more than two years for the announcement of any mergers and acquisitions. And also we've had such a string of terrible IPO situations, uh, particularly the last one being WeWork but also others that we've had, like Uber had its difficulties at the beginning. Generally speaking then, it's led to a very difficult period for advisory fees in the investment banking divisions of a lot of these banks. So trading might be up, uh, mortgages and consumer related um, components may be quite positive, but the rate environment and investment banking fees are probably gonna be particular weak spots. Uh, with that in mind, who is actually coming out today? So here's a full list. Um, I know it's a bit small, so let me just zoom this in so we can get a bit more of a sense of what we're looking at. So these are in chronological order in London time, BST, New York time, obviously EDT. And so pre-market today, we have the likes of United Health, BlackRock, Johnson & Johnson, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, City, Wells Fargo, Charles Schwab. Uh, aftermarket, much smaller firms. Um, looking at some of the numbers then, if I just zoom this out, I'll talk you through them. So the EPS for United Health is expected at $3.45, and their estimated quarterly revenues at $60.58 billion. They're due just before 11 a.m. London time. So they're the first one of major kind of market capitalization to come out this morning. Of the bigger banks, you're going to get uh, JP Morgan at 12, Goldman's is 12.30, Citi's at 1.00. EPS expected at 251, five dollars and 181 respectively, and then Johnson and Johnson actually is the biggest pre-market company to report. They've got a market cap of just shy of 380 billion dollars. Uh, they should be just before midday, 11:40 a.m. London time, 6:40 New York. Uh, their EPS expected 244, revenues expected at 20.29 billion. So if anyone needs these numbers in a bit more detail, uh, I do have more estimates here for their yearly outlook as well in terms of the current existing guidance with the streets looking for. Just drop me a message in Trading Live and I'll be happy to, to ping those over to you. All right, moving on, away from earnings, China and Brexit. I'm going to be looking at oil prices later on this evening because, of course, it's Tuesday, so we'll be looking out for the API inventories. 
Now, WTI, I did mention, is down about 40 cents this morning, trading close to the $53 handle. So a little bit of the wind coming out the sale of the positivity on the back of the partial trade deal between the US and China, just dampening things a touch. And then also uh, expectations are for continuation of more infantry builds in terms of crude stockpiles on the weekly change in the US. And analysts see or anticipate the fifth weekly gain. That would be the longest consecutive gain of builds uh, in stockpiles uh, since February, going back to this period that we had here. So, yeah, the supplied nature of of what's happening at the moment uh, definitely is weighing the diminishing kind of returns out of the trade deal. And then one thing I did see, actually, let me just quickly, I was reading this on the way in it'll pop up but I did read that Saudi Arabia well let me just quickly pop onto here so I can bring it out Saudi Aramco is now said to be pumping as much oil as before the tax last month so you remember at the time we had this really aggressive what was it a $10 gap up on on that recommencement of trades um, after that drone strike that we had on those major facilities of Saudi Aramco. However, Aramco has said that it's now pumping as much as before the attacks. So again, the, the kind of speed of which they've managed to get things back online hasn't really taken that long. There were some fears that it could have taken multiple weeks, up to two months at the time, but obviously it's been a little bit quicker than that. So that's another kind of negative drag in that sense that, that the Saudis have managed to get back online so quickly. Okay, off of oil, the other thing was I just wanted to have a quick peek at some Chinese data overnight. Uh, Factory deflation worsens, uh, adding to global economic woes. CPI, though, accelerates to 3%. It's the fastest since 2013. A couple of things then. It's no surprise to see a continued divergence between these two metrics. Um, The consumer price index CPI at 3% year over year being the fastest increase in a couple of years, was driven predominantly by food prices climbing 11.2% uh, and more than 69% jump that's been seen in pork prices, obviously due to the fever and subsequent slaughter of millions of pigs that have pushed up prices in China. Also, um, what some of these articles are suggesting, which makes sense, is that breeders are unlikely to rush to restock their herds in a meaningful way because there's still lingering fears of recontamination and catching the disease again, which obviously comes at a great expense because it takes a lot of time to, um, to, (laughs) it's not like you can just switch on and and suck up the oil out of the ground. Pigs need to be uh, born, reared uh, and fed. And it's a long arduous process that is quite expensive. And if they hold off on that, then all the more reason why a lot of people believe you're going to get a continuation then of this over time. The other thing is, if we're looking at a medium term perspective, don't forget in January, you get the Lunar New Year holiday in China. And what we typically see there then is a front loading and demand for goods. And and certainly then uh, analysts at Nomura have said in a research note this morning that they say that CPI in China could rise close to 4% in January. Uh, in order to um, reflect that kind of activity. The producer price inflation, they also go on to say, uh, may fall even more due to weakening domestic demand, falling energy and raw material prices, and a value-added tax cut that became effective in April this year. So all the more reason why it is important that China do look to broker some kind of uh, partial deal at least with um, the US. Obviously, there's that threat December, so you know, this is all going to rear its ugly head again in a few months' time, particularly going to that Christmas period, which will be interesting. Uh, but it shows, and as per Premier Li saying, warning of increasing downward pressures in the economy, all the more reason that they need to take proactive action uh, to mitigate that at the moment, which they continue to do so. Um, this was just a graphic to give you a bit of an idea and a sense about how outperforming food CPI is as a component at the moment that's really driving this divergence between the red and the black line. Okay, um, quickly then, just wrapping up with the calendar. 
uh, what have we got? So this morning we get the latest jobs update. Remember, you've got the full kind of suite of UK data this week. Jobs data today, CPI tomorrow, retail sales Thursday, alongside all the Brexit drama and also a whole host of Bank of England speakers of which Mark Carney is making a parliamentary treasury committee uh, testimony later on this morning. Now that latter point is very rarely important or market moving. Usually it's just him reiterating the current stances, but given he's the governor, maybe worth keeping half an ear on that commences at 9.30 a.m. just when all the jobs data will come out. Um, then we've got ZEW from Germany. Um, could be quite interesting to look at. Uh, analysts are anticipating a further deterioration in just general forward-looking sentiment for the euro area, uh, particularly under this uncertain cloud of, of the trade war situation developing, because even though there's a partial deal struck for China, what's going to happen with the, the single market in, in the euro area? And then later on this afternoon, you've got the New York Fed um, manufacturing figure, or actually the API, just to update myself and, and to correct myself, we had the Columbus Day holiday, of course, yesterday in the US. So the API inventories will not be tonight, they'll be tomorrow, just as a, a reminder. Um, then Fed's Bullard, voter and a dissenter, as well as being one of the most dovish members of the Fed, he's speaking at 9.25 this morning. Might be worth keeping an eye out for uh, to see whether or not he's backing not just one, but potentially two cuts in towards the year end. Uh, and then you've got another Bank of England speaker a bit later on this afternoon. Um, that then there is more Fed speakers. You got Bostic, George, and Daly, all scheduled as well throughout this afternoon and this evening. And as I mentioned, you've got all those bank earnings coming. City, Goldman's, Wells Fargo, and then also to be aware of is Johnson and Johnson all coming out pre-market. Okay, guys, that's it from me. I know quite a lot to take on board. Um, I'd say though, in summary, um, Brexit headlines just. The market remains susceptible to still quite a lot of further developments. I'd expect more rumours, more tweets like that from Tony Connolly to come from other journalists throughout the day. So just be mindful of your, your execution of trades within that product if you are looking at it. I'd be realistic with the time frame of holding any open position for, for too long a period. Uh, then you've got the earnings to also consider for the rest of today. Uh, and in the trade war, I'd say I'm not looking for too much spectacular to come out of that this, this morning. It's kind of more of an update than it is anything to be aware of for, for strategies today, I'd say. OK, hand you over to Sam and I wish you a good day. Thanks very much. Yeah, Hi, guys. Hope we're, we're doing well. Good to be uh, back on. First one of the week. Uh, just having a, a quick look over. We'll start with the Euro. Uh, as that did, uh, it's come under a bit of pressure this morning, breaking through. Uh, a bit of a trend line you can see on there as well, you know, very well. That, uh, I do love a bit of a trend and, and that break, you know, coinciding with the, the false push above yesterday's high. We're seeing a, a move down towards today's S1 and, and yesterday's low. So uh, that sort of containing things for now. And I guess as well, just looking at uh, the price action from yesterday, we just, we just remove this trend because really you could argue it, it starts a bit lower down as well and I was looking at this coming through uh, from around here let me just move that up a bit so you can almost have the sort of the the, the false push again from yesterday above this uh, left shoulder if you like from the 10th we obviously go through higher on uh, on the Friday uh, and then the break of this trend uh, that we've now seen this morning uh, as it as it comes lower um, so looking at that and of course now this trend line as we can say we can probably move that uh, to be more accurate just over the last session or so that on a retest would, would come around the pivot so you know if it wasn't because of the, the break of that I wouldn't really fancy the pivot too much but I'd, I'd certainly be interested to see what happens uh, on a retest of that trend line other than that really looking at the euro obviously the highs from yesterday and today and then the lows from uh, Friday as well which of course brings in some of those uh, highs as well from from the previous uh, well from the beginning of the month from some of the pre previous weeks uh, would be areas of support as well so for, for me for the euro just looking at three levels really retested that trend although it does come into a choppy area so I wouldn't if going short wouldn't be looking to hold for too long 
if it didn't uh, really go straight away and then up to the to those highs as well and and the lows there uh, to, to keep uh, a watch on on the charts the pound at the moment void but could uh, could easily come lower as we all all know of uh, just one headline or, or lack of development yesterday's uh, low was obviously a great opportunity to have got in 2541 also if we just scoot to the left a bit you can see was the and I'll put this above the, the camera was the high of the 24th um, which has, has been offered a, a great level to, to get in uh, again and, and since then we have drifted higher from that low probably worth having on a, a trend line as well for uh, the remainder of the day is we have had one one two three tests of it obviously that looking to come in just above the pivot also if it was to happen now the the low of the day as well so a bit of a guide maybe for line in the sand to, to say happy to stay long from a technical point of view as long as that trend line holds the previous high of the day is just acted as support now so Given everything that's going on, fundamentally, technically, still going, you know, and, and acting quite well. Uh, so 26.60 uh, for a level support. The trend line as well uh, to act as points to to keep this uh, market going to to the upside. The high that we had last week, 27.36. Uh, we almost reached that today. Uh, give or take 10 10 ticks or so. So that would obviously be the the key resistance point uh, to the upside to to keep a keep a watch on and have monitored. Uh, yesterday we saw a pretty flat day to be honest across the board for, for equities. We did come lower in the morning only to you know come back and then just hug that pivot for the remainder of the session. Pretty quiet, much the similar to last Monday I, I guess with you know a lack of data to, to drive things. Uh, but however we have pushed pushed on and just above where we're trading in stocks so we're keeping an eye on on this whole level. Uh, you also got the high from yesterday, which we touched a couple of times, dropping that down to 15 and five minutes. You know, you can see those lows were just starting to get squeezed in, perhaps. So as long as we stay above that trend line, it might be that you are favouring uh, a break to the upside below. Uh, be looking for uh, price to just drift back down, maybe focusing on what was quite a key resistance point this morning. You can see again tested a couple of times here on the 15 minute. 29.74 uh, on the dot one two three breakthrough so i'll be keeping a, a watch on that much like the pound as well a couple of trends to, to keep an eye on from the lows of yesterday uh, good sort of guides and lines in the sand above where we're trading now if we can get get two there we're keeping a watch on a bit of a breakdown area from friday uh, as well 29.87 before we're then looking at those highs from Friday as well. So uh, a bit of a, a five point push wouldn't be too surprising above the, the break of that high trend line and previous high of the day as well to keep an eye on uh, for areas of support. Gold has been a, an interesting one um, over the last sort of few weeks really. That, where's it gone? Here we go. That uh, 1492 level had offered a really good sort of guide multiple times as, as to what's uh, going to happen and you can see here just bringing that in we get the breakthrough offers good resistance before the ism number comes out and then we broke again broke again last week to to the downside and quite uh, a few good opportunities as we came back to test that before breaking through and now back above it uh, and we'd almost reached that this morning so i'd still have that marked on as a, a decent area of support uh, and also the opportunity to get short should it, it break through. And then, of course, we, we'd be looking at some of the lows from yesterday uh, as well. So 1492 in the futures, uh, give or take, you know, a few pips either way, is, is still certainly uh, a level of interest uh, that I would have on. Looking at it more intraday above where we're trading, you can see we are trending lower from uh, the high. Probably worth seeing if we can get anything on, on that. Relatively steep, but just now, uh, within the last seven minutes you can see we've got the third test of that trend so people are looking at it I would have it on break above that you could you may be looking to, to get a push towards 1497 so not a massive move but given the time of the day it might be worth looking later on anyway the high of the day almost reaching a, an interesting area from uh, yesterday where we broke down into the afternoon around 1499 but of course 1500 uh, as well so uh, another level of resistance to keep a watch on and just above there really you can see 
going back to Friday as well, it's quite a big zone where the sellers have taken over uh, a couple of times. So keeping an eye on this trend line resistance around 1500 to the top side, R1, you've got quite a, a nice bit of price action as well from Friday that you would keep a watch on. Uh, below 40.92, S1, lows of yesterday, and then Friday's lows as well could come into the mix to, to keep a watch on uh, as well. Just going back to, to stocks, obviously S&P near that high and uh, worth keeping that trend line on. The fact that the DAX is just struggling to get above its R2, already a decent move, um, may halt its progress uh, over in the States. So keep a, a watch on that as we just start to, to drift down and we are now below the high that we had on Friday uh, as well. So a couple of attempts at trying to get through there, uh, just failing to do so. Uh, for now looking uh, just uh, below where we're trading on the DAX so keep a watch of course on what was the high overnight on Friday we can see a decent reaction this morning once we have broken through uh, so 12,514 uh, a level of support to keep a watch on below there obviously got those previous highs as well from yesterday and today so again the markets you know acting quite technically Obviously, with those those biases to, to look to maybe wait for resistance to break or for levels of support to come back. Uh, certainly yesterday was relatively slow, but I wouldn't be too surprised to see things start picking up from today uh, as well. Any questions, as usual, please uh, do let us know. Uh, we'll be on the mic throughout the day, uh, but I uh, hope you all have a, a good one and catch you all in the chat.